Okay, sacred families, developing the family according to God's design. This is lesson number seven. Title of this lesson, Preparing for Teen Parenting. Preparing for Teen Parenting, and this is part two. Let's do a bit of review. In part one of this topic, Preparing for Teen Parenting, we review the different stages of development uh, that each child goes through on the way to adolescence uh, or on the way to becoming teenagers. Uh, I briefly explained these along with the developmental goals parents should have for each stage. In other words, parents are having goals. They're trying to accomplish something at each stage of the development of the child. Very helpful you know, if we have goals, if we know what we want to accomplish. So last time we said from zero to three years roughly, uh, parents become the authority figures. In other words, parents go from strictly being caregivers to being authority figures. From zero to three, the child is at the center of the universe, the center of his or her own universe. Everyone caters to the child, but by the, the time they get to three, a displacement needs to take place. Uh, the person at the center of their world has to be the parent, not the child. That's when the child begins learning uh, that the parent is the one who's in uh, control. If they don't learn that then, it's going to be, it gets harder and harder to teach that as they, get, as they get older. And then we said from three to 11, the task, proper socialization. We want to socialize children so they can properly interact with other people outside the family. They know the difference between if uh, Uncle Bob comes along, we can jump on Uncle Bob, we can pull his ears and he has fun, but we don't jump on somebody who just comes in who's a stranger. You know, we, we, we show them the difference uh, uh, between uh, these uh, two things. Uh, I said that these goals need to be reached so that the child be equipped to enter pre-adolescence, the tween years, 11 to 13. And the reason for that is they enter in the tween years with the emotional and social skills to mature through adolescence into adulthood successfully. You know, people go through these things, but the relative success is, uh, you know, is different from family to family. So we want them to go through those teen years and succeed as adults. So today we're going to look at the terrible tweens, stage three. Um, so we've had a period where the child is the center of his own universe, cared for, pampered, catered to. Then the break into reality where the parent begins to assert his authority. Next comes a long period of training and personal responsibility in order to properly socialize the child and instill our values and our spiritual life in that child. And I mentioned a couple of you know, sub goals there. Uh, we we want to teach them that they are responsible for their choices. You know, that three to 11. They're responsible for the choices that they make. They own them. Also, we're wanting to teach them that choices have consequences. You know, uh, last week, pick something simple. We're going to the movies where we're bringing candy with us. Oh, you ate all your candy before the movie even started? Oh, too bad, no more candy. You know, they, we, we, they have to own the choices and the consequences. And also that life is not always fair. That's a little harder one to teach them. As Christian parents, we have a, an advantage there. But life isn't always fair. However, doing the right thing is the reward for doing the right thing. The fact that you've done the right thing is its own reward. Again, another subtle lesson. Uh, especially in the environment that we live in today where, uh, as I say, children get trophies just for being named Ralph or something. You know? So we, you know, we want to show them that life, life is not always fair. Uh, but then around 12 years of age, it dawns on this pre-adolescent that he will not be living with his parents forever. Somehow he begins to think that his future is not with them, but with his own generation. So sometime during the preteen or tween period, the child is going to unplug from his parents and plug into his peers. 
All right? Unplug from the parents, plug into the peers. And the media and the educational system and the marketing companies will all encourage this process. They will all applaud this. They will all take advantage of the fact that the loyalty goes from the family to the peer group. Now in the book Teen Proofing, Dr. Roseman calls it peer group worship. Peer group worship. The problem for the parents is that almost overnight they feel that they are losing control of the parent-child relationship. They're saying things like, where did you get that? Or whose child is this? You know, jokingly. What's, going, what's with you? Who are you? <laughs> They're saying stuff like that. So what's happening is the reverse of what took place at the terrible twos. At that time, the parent removed the child from the center and placed the parent and the authority figure in the center of their lives. And it was done rather suddenly and it caused trauma. And that trauma we usually refer to as the terrible twos. You're saying no 500 times a day and the kid is freaking out all the time. Meltdowns, five meltdowns a day. Okay, so now the child removes the parent from the center of attention and puts the peer group in the center of attention. For some parents, this is traumatic and they fight to remain central and this begins the long conflict that lasts throughout the teen years. That's what's happening. Of course, what preteens are doing is that they are they are asserting their independence. Think about it for a moment. For nine years or so, the parent has been at the center of their lives uh, uh, and in authority. And so now a change is taking place as the child puts peers at the center of attention, starts looking to them for um, how to act, what's right or what's wrong. The peer group begins to determine you know, clothing styles and attitudes, not the parents. Now, listen, I'm not saying this is right, this is wrong. I'm just saying that's what's happening. And this change is encouraged, if you wish. Remember I said at the very first lesson, 100 years ago, no such thing as teenagers. 100 years ago, no such thing as marketing strictly to teenagers. Entertainment, entire channels on the TV, strictly for teenagers, movies, just for teenagers. They didn't have that 100 years ago. Now, I mean, everything is you know, to that group. Of course they're going to transfer their allegiance from their parents to this exciting peer group. This exciting peer group that is supported and flattered and, and, and aggrandized in movies and So they begin acting like peer approval is more important than parental approval. <laughs> I remember when I was going through that, you know, in those days, you know, I went to Catholic boys school where you had to wear a shirt and tie and a jacket every day. You know. And one day you know, I decided I was going to wear a blue shirt. There was a family thing going on, I don't know what, but anyways, I was going to wear a blue shirt and a tie, you know, and my mother, a blue shirt? Well, it's just not done, and of course it was. In those days, you know, wow, they were coming out with blue and pale yellow and pink and shirt, dress shirts for men, and I thought, whoa, this is so cool. You know, my mother was just, you know, we, had, we argued over this stuff. Well, you just don't wear a blue shirt with a suit, you know. I mean, it sounds dumb today with the, with the styles, but it is exactly what, what everybody at school was doing with the blue shirts. At this point, the child derives primary security, identity, and acceptance from the peer group. This is why gang, you know, gangs, this is why gang recruitment is aimed at kids in this age group. 
they go get them at that age because at that age they're unplugging from the parents and they're plugging into the peer group. And if the peer group is a gang, well, you know, the gang tells them that they're okay and the security and you're cool and you're acceptable and all that kind of stuff. Now it's okay if the gang is the Boy Scouts or something like that, you know, good values, and, but it's not okay if the gang steals, pass, does drugs and uh, yeah. So at this age, it's not enough that parents accept you. You need your peers to accept you. That's why when you say to your daughter, you look so pretty in that dress. I love that dress you're wearing. Oh, mom. <laughs> Talking to, she's not saying you don't know anything about fashion. She's saying, you're supposed to say that. You're my mother. But it doesn't give me any thrill that you're saying that. But if my peer group says, oh yeah, cool, nice, yeah. Now, it, now it's okay. Now the child changes the rules and it's the parents who begin to feel insecure. And so a tug of war begins over who has the control. So you've taught them to make decisions. You've taught them to take ownership for their decisions and now they do. And it frightens parents because it's so dangerous out there. And, and our children are so young. Well, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I wanted you to take ownership and I wanted you to make decisions like when you're 25, not when you're 11, 12. So in response to this change, parents usually do one of three things. Number one, they micromanage. They redouble their efforts at reestablishing their authority. They strap a GPS device to their teen's ankle. <clears throat> they snoop in their email or text or Snapchat or whatever they're doing or they want to account for every minute. What time did you go over to Joanne's? What time did you leave? How long did it take you to go over to Penny's? How long were you there? Oh, you stopped at the restaurant. Did you eat? I want an accounting, minute by minute. I want to know all the activities. I want to know all your friends. The thing is, micromanagers do not listen they do not discuss, they do not debate, they make and enforce rules. That's what micromanagers do. And why is this? Because rules equal safety. <laughs> rules equal, so again, nothing bad, because rules do equal safety. However, the only problem with this style of response is that it does not work in the long run. And it does not work because it does not teach and it does not build. It only creates conflict. The more you micromanage, the more conflict you will experience. What does Paul say? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Ephesians 6, 4. It's nothing new. So when he says this here, exasperate, frustrate by the way you parent, so obeying you becomes difficult because you are either inconsistent or unreasonable or foolish. So the more you micromanage, the more devious your children become. You got 10 rules about how to you know, you know, figure out where they're going to be. They got 10 ways to get out of those things. I thought when pagers came, anybody remember pagers? Remember pagers? We don't use those anymore, I think. But anyway, when they came out, man, I thought that was manna from heaven. Oh, wow, pagers. Well, the kids are going to have pagers. That way I will know. You know. I will be able to be in touch with them at every moment of the day. I can just drop in and call at 11 p.m. and find out where are you, what's going on, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I found out, oh, sorry, Dad, the battery, battery must have been dead on my pager. 
<laughs> oh, I left it in the car. Yeah, you see, <clears throat> the more you micromanage, the more resentful they become. And you get stuff like, you don't trust me. I trust you. No, you don't. And if I feel you don't trust me, to me that means you don't love me. Because if you don't trust me, if you love me, you trust me. So if you don't trust me, that means you don't, you don't love me. And most importantly, I think, the more we micromanage, the more ill-prepared the child is to actually go into adulthood. So that's one response, knee-jerk response to what's happening when they unplug from us and plug into the peer group. Number two, some people, some parents become permissive. Parents who let their children control the parent-child relationship. It's the kid who's in control. <laughs> this is the model that we see in you know, comedies, you know, TV things. The kid's in control of the relationship. You know, 13 year old girl and mom is a single mom and mom is saying to the third, well what should I do Penny? Dick just broke off with me. Well mom, you ought to you know, go talk to him. The tween will scream and whine and pout and parents give in because they do not want to lose their child's friendship. I want them to like me. Believe it or not, it's more important they obey you than they like you. But some parents, of course, depending on how they were raised, being liked is more important than being obeyed. They don't want to lose their child's friendship. This usually happens because the parent never was able to establish the primary authority role at the beginning and then abandons it now as well. In Proverbs 29, to discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. Now there are a lot of reasons for permissive parenting as a response to tweens. Uh, guilt from divorce. Guilt from divorce. Or the long illness of a sibling or, an, or one of the parents. You, know, you, have a, you have the mom or the dad who's been hospitalized for a long time fighting cancer or something like that where all the attention has gone there, the time and the effort has gone there and somehow uh, we think it's burdening the child to discipline the child. They're rewarded for having you know, kind of struggled through the illness. They're rewarded for that by, by being given permission to do things that you know, they should. By giving them a, a certain level of independence that they shouldn't have at that age. Or the absence of one parent for whatever reason leaving the responsibility on just one partner to do all of the parenting. And sometimes you just have personality types, people who are very passive in their nature. Or laziness, I mean, that's part of it too. It's, it's a lot of work disciplining children because it's an everyday thing. You got to do it over and over and over and over again and sometimes you just get tired of it. Come on, I want a break. Let somebody else discipline them. I'm tired. It's a natural, you know, it's a natural feeling, of course. So whatever the reason for their permissive response, these parents do their, theen, their teens a disservice and not providing them what they really need to make it safely through their adolescent years. And what they need is mentoring. They need a guide, not a guard. <laughs> they need a guide, not a guard. And so the third way, I mean there may be five ways, but I've, I've picked these three because they're the most common. Mentoring. What has to happen during this particular time, you know, when the tween unplugs from the parent and plugs into his or her peer group, 
What has to happen during this time as tweens shift the center of attention to their peer group is that parents have to transition also from authority figure to mentor, that's the thing. They're, we've prepped them to change. We've prepped them, we want them to be independent. We want them to make decisions on their own. And when they begin doing that, we also have to change. We have to change from being the authority figure to being the mentor. There has to be a change in us as well. You know, definition of mentor, an experienced, trusted advisor. Now, it's not done overnight. You don't have a family meeting and just say, okay, from, now, from here on in, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. But the exercise of shifting one to the other becomes the substance of your relationship with your teen. In other words, the substance of your relationship must not be you yelling at them to obey the rules. That, if that's the substance of your relationship, them obeying your rules or not obeying your rules, and a constant cycle and tug of war going on, they want their independence, you're not going to give it to them, and I mean, whew, that, that'll wear you out. <clears throat> But if the substance of your relationship is you mentoring them, discussing, experimenting, talking through things, then that becomes much more rewarding for you as the parent and much more encouraging for them as the child. In other words, you're seeing and accepting that they are changing and then they are seeing and accepting that you also are changing. So mentors realize that what they control is the parent-child relationship, not the child. And why, why? Because you can't control the child. You can't do that. I mean, you can try, but as I told you, the more you try to control them, the more devious they become. So in this relationship, you know, the idea that we, the parents, control the parent-child relationship and not the child, that doesn't mean there are no rules. There are rules that are based on principles learned in the previous stage, you know, from three to 11. There are still rules and there is enforcement of the rules. You know, as far as curfew is concerned, what you can consume and what you cannot consume, where you can go, where you can, I mean, those things still there. But the relationship is not based on policing the rules. It's based on developing a new kind of relationship, teacher-student relationship. So a mentor parent controls the relationship in that he or she controls the consequences of the choices that are made, but does not always control the choices. Easy to say, easy to hear, not so easy to do. You know, Adam and Eve, God allowed them to exercise free will, knowing and controlling the consequences. They knew the rules, they knew the consequences, He let them make the choice. I give an example from our own family. So I'm, I'm a neat person, I like neatness, I like order, you know, just the way that I am. So we had four teenagers at the same time, they each had their room. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'd go by on a Tuesday and dishes from the previous Friday would be on the floor and clothes everywhere and you know, homework books, you know, it was a mess. And for a time, it, I mean, my parenting was all about pick up your stuff, hey, you remember? Uh, even I would go in and straighten out, you know, because that was me. Finally, okay, that's not going to work. It's going to be a long life if I do that. So we had a meeting and the meeting said, okay, it's going to be the Mazalongo cleanup day. Every Saturday at noon, Mazalongo, me, will go into your rooms and I will do an inspection. 
No dirty dishes, no clothes on the floor, things, probably, beds made, blah, 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 yeah. And if that works, if that's okay, the weekend is yours, my friend. But if you fail inspection, then don't think about you know, going to Susie's tonight or you know, whatever. So the choice was, it's your room. You live in it the way you want for six and a half days. Just do what you want. I mean, it drove me crazy anyways, but it was their choice. They got to choose how their room was going to be because it was their room. It wasn't their house. They couldn't leave dirty dishes and junk in the living room. OK. But it was their room. How they chose to leave it was their business until a particular time. So there were still rules. But they had, you know, they had some skin in the game. So I hated the mess all week, but I was willing to live by their choice. And today, you know, if you go to their houses, they're still a mess. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> so mentor parents are in the process of transferring the responsibility for their teen's life over to the teen. And the teen knows this. I mean, I remember conversations with our children at different times, and this was the substance of the conversation. It's your life. It's your life. It's not my life. You get to make the choices that you make. And unless it's a choice that will cause instant death, you know, I will not interfere. You want to go in the Marine Corps when you're 18? I think maybe you ought to go to college first, you ought to do this and that, but is that, that's what you want to do? It's your choice. Your life, your choice. You want to buy that car? I don't know about that car, but is that the car you want to buy? It's your, it's your money, it's your choice. The idea is that the, both you know, both the parent and the teen, both of them are aware that there is a transfer of responsibility taking place from you to them. It's when they think that you're trying to hang on to them tight all the time that they're going to push back harder and harder. But if they understand, hey look, my goal for you is that you become an independent human being, an independent adult, and the sooner the better. I'm not trying to control you till you're 30. I want you to take control of your life as soon as you can. I want to help you do that. Remember the rope idea? You know, we talked about the rope idea. They have one end of the rope. There's lots of rope. And at the beginning, there's only made to be a foot of, you know, a foot of rope between you and them. But as you see that they can kind of make good decisions and so on and so forth, you, you kind of let the rope go until you're not holding any part of the rope anymore. That's how parenting needs to be. If the child knows that you're actively trying to allow them to be independent, there's a lot less screaming and yelling about you know, control in the family. When both are willing partners in the process, when both Parent and child know that the goal is your independence, the child's independence. I want you to be independent. And if between three and 11, they've learned that you know, uh, choices have consequences and they're going to own the consequences, if they've learned that at a less dangerous level, you, know, you ate all your candy before the movie, okay, no more candy. You know, if they've learned that as they go, then they're not going to make self-destructive choices as they grow older. We hope not anyways. Because they've learned from an early age that, hey, if I make a choice and things go bad, I own it. Daddy is not going to come in, not going to swoop in every time and you know, negate the, uh, the results of my choices. I can count on mom and dad. I know they're for me, they're behind me but they're not going to make good every bad choice I make. If I understand that, I might be just a little more careful when I'm making choices. 
And you ever notice like having a lot of money, you know when you don't have any money and all you have is a credit card, somehow spending is easy? You just go in, yeah, charge it, whatever. You know, well, next month we'll worry about it. And then all of a sudden you get some money, I don't know, a gift, or something, and you got a thousand bucks in your pocket. Have you ever noticed when you actually have the money in your pocket and you go in and somebody's showing you something, you go, yeah, I'll think about it. You know? You're not so ready to spend the money when you've actually got it in your pocket. It's the same thing when you already know that your parents want you to be independent. They want you to kind of stand up on your own. Somehow you're less moved to do crazy things in order to establish that you are independent. You know you are. You know your parents are giving it to you. So obviously you know, so much more to all of this than what we've covered in our two little sessions here. But these are important highlights. Just a few things to remember as parents. Each child is different. I think you figured that out by now. The goals for each child are the same, but because each child is different, so will our strategies be different to reach the same goals with each child. Because they're all different. That's what books and seminars and sharing with other parents, that's what that's all about. Figuring out strategies to use in order to reach these goals with each of our children. And I'm sure you know, if we went around, you'd all say the same thing. You know, I had three boys, you know, my, my buddy Ron, he said, well, three boys and they're all different. We had four, Lisa and I have four children. They're all different. They all have their own different personalities. A very unique person. And I think every parent could say the same, the same thing. Each child is different. They come with their own you know, DNA. They're already, they already have a program in them when, they, when, they're, when they're born. Each child has a mind of his own. You, you can mold and you can temper a child's essential character, but you can't change it. If you think that success with a child is that you're going to change his character to this over here, which is more acceptable to you, uh-uh. <laughs> Give up now. <laughs> Throw in the towel now. That, that, that doesn't work. You have to work with the character that that child has to reach that goal. The goal stays the same. The child is different. And <laughs> they each have their own character. You know, they're not just blank pages that we write on. They come with a built-in program that we have to work with. And that's the hard part of parenting. You have one child, you know, a couple years later, you have another child and say, okay, I got it now. You know, I may have made mistakes with the first one, but boy, this second one, you know, <laughs> then you get you know, wild child number two. You know. And then the greatest comfort for me, parents cannot produce sinless children. You are not the only force and influence in your child's life. You can't be. Accept it now. They will sin to a greater or lesser degree. You know Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That goes for your children too. They're sinners. Your job is to help them know how to deal with the sin in their lives. That's your job. You know the point here, if God Himself did not have children who did not sin, why should you think you can do better? What a burden, what a burden. You know, parents say, I, I, want, I want better for my child. And it doesn't matter how successful you are now, you still want better for your child. Every parent is like that. And I think that's a legitimate thing. You know, if I went to college, well, maybe I want my child to go to college too, but to get beyond what I did. If I succeeded in business, I want my child, whatever they're in, I want them to have a greater success. We're not jealous of our children's success. We want them to succeed way beyond whatever we managed to do. And that's a legitimate thing. <laughs> but you want them to be like a better person than you are? What makes you think they're going to be like a better person than you are? They're sinners. They're going to have to learn about redemption, they're going to have to learn about grace, they're going to have to learn about 
you know, the, the work of the Spirit in their, in their souls to, to mature them as, as Christians, they're going to have to learn all of that. You know, why do we think they're going to be just better than we are all of a sudden, just because we raised them? <laughs> you know, God allowed Adam and Eve to make and own their choices, but He provided the way to be redeemed. And that's what we can give them that is valuable. So as a parent, I feel that I've succeeded if my, uh, if my children go to God in faith to receive forgiveness and renewal in Christ for their failures and their sins, that's when I've succeeded. Not if they never make a mistake, but if they know what to do when they make a mistake, physically, obviously, and spiritually as well. So preparing for teen parenting is a long process. The more you invest at an early age, the more you will benefit when they become teens. I think this may be what Solomon was getting at when he said the following, direct your children onto the right path and when they are older, they will not leave it. This is not a guarantee that they will choose the right path. Some parents, Christian parents saying, I don't understand, I sent them to Christian school, they went to camp every summer, and blah, 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 and they came to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, we were always in church, blah, 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 and they're not living like you know, they were raised. How come? You know, Solomon says, if you direct your child you know, onto, is that scripture not true? Well, the scripture here is not saying that if you raise them as a good Christian parent should, that they're going to follow the right path. What he's saying is if you show them the right path and then they choose it, to cho they choose to go the right way, they will know the way to go. If your child is a prodigal son or daughter, what this scripture is saying is if you taught that prodigal where the right path is, when they decide to come back to the right way, they will know which one it is and they will follow it. The problem in our world is no one's teaching their children you know, the path of Christ. Well, no one, but you know what I'm saying. We're living in a secular society. So when those prodigal sons and daughters want to go the right way, they don't know where to go. The best they can do, 12-step program, or I'm seeing a psychologist. That, you know, I'm seeing a shrink. That's the best they can do. So Solomon says, you give them the right path. And if they're on it, and stay on it, great. If they, if they lose their way, they will know where to go back when they decide to go back. All right, um, next time we're going to talk about role reversal, the reversal of roles between parents and children. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention.